I'm Danielle Harris. And I'm Scout Compton. And we're the host of Talk, Talk Scary, Scary to, to Me. Me. We love everything horror, spooky, eerie, terrifying, and sexy. Yes. Get to know the deeper, darker side of growing up in the horror industry as we share never before told stories from our lives on and off the set. Viewer discretion is advised. Now listen to Talk Scary to Me on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, it's Jamie. Today I'm re-releasing an episode of Murderish, covering a case that's very near and dear to my heart. It's the case of first grader Gabriel Fernandez from Palmdale, California. His mother, Pearl Fernandez, was an unfit parent, completely detached from her children. Plain and simple, she despised her young son and put him through years of neglect and abuse. Pearl's boyfriend also took part in the abuse until it escalated to a point at which young Gabriel's body had sustained all it could take. Gabriel lost his life at the hands of people who should have loved and protected him. Gabriel's murder could have been prevented. Cracks in the Child Protective Services system, many argue, are what landed the young boy in unsafe hands. This case has kept me up many nights. And as difficult as it is to hear about, I think Gabriel's story needs to stay in the public's attention in order to prevent this from happening to other children. Please join me as I highlight 8-year-old Gabriel Fernandez. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, Ishers, it's Jamie. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. I'm a little under the weather, so if my voice sounds a little funky, please forgive me. The case I'm covering in this episode is one that I've said before I would never cover. I said that because we all have cases that cut us deeper than others, and this is that case for me. It is the most horrendous case I have learned of, and for my own selfish reasons, I have never allowed myself to gain any in-depth knowledge of it because it's just too painful. But what I've come to realize is that what this young boy went through makes my feelings about the case completely insignificant. In other words, no matter how tough it is for me to learn what actually happened, the emotions this case evoke in me will never ever come close to what this young boy felt, both physically and emotionally. I understand this case will be very difficult for people to hear, but I hope that by listening, you'll get to know a young boy who deserves to be known and remembered. I also hope that anyone working in a position involving children can use this tragedy to make certain they will do everything in their power, and then some, to ensure this never happens under their watch. This case involves extreme child abuse and the death of a child. That child's name is Gabriel Fernandez, and this is part of his story. Michelle, Mark, there really isn't a reprieve in this case. Each day of this trial, very difficult. On the stand today, Gabriel's first grade teacher, she spent the most time with Gabriel and said that he opened up to her about the abuse he was experiencing at home. Written in the shaky, unsure handwriting of a first grader, Gabriel's teacher reads a note she found hidden in the eight-year-old's desk a few days after she learned of his brutal death. I love you, Mom, and Gabriel is a good boy. Jennifer Garcia said Gabriel confided in her early on in the school year, telling her he was beaten at home. Garcia immediately reported this to the Department of Children and Family Services. She's like, well, sometimes my mom makes me believe. And I said, well, where do you believe? And he said, well, on my body. Because she hits me with a belt. And he's like, you know that part with the metal on it? Mm-hmm. He's like, that part. Over the next few months, Garcia said she saw repeated bruises, burns, wounds, and other injuries on the boy, and said in at least one instance, Gabriel came to school wearing girls' clothes. The city of Palmdale, California, lies in the north-central part of Los Angeles County in the high desert area in Southern California. 
It's a popular destination for people wanting to stretch their dollar a little further when it comes to buying property. Los Angeles is a very expensive place to live, but Palmdale offers larger homes with more land at more affordable prices. As with almost any city, there are good areas and also more seedy and impoverished areas. Approximately 21% of the Palmdale population lives below the federal poverty line. Notable people from Palmdale include hip-hop artist Afro Man, former U.S. Olympic track star Marion Jones, and legendary actor John Wayne. On Wednesday, May 22, 2013, 911 operators received a call from the 200 block of East Avenue Q10 in Palmdale. Emergency personnel responded to a report of a boy who was no longer breathing. When paramedics arrived, 12-year-old Ezekiel Fernandez let them in, taking them to the bedroom where his younger brother Gabriel was lying, naked and wet, on the floor. Gabriel was unresponsive. Once the paramedics began to examine the eight-year-old boy, they found that he had two fractures on his skull, three broken ribs, two missing teeth, BB marks in his skin, and cigarette burns covering his feet and genitals. There was skin missing from his neck and cat feces lodged in his throat. James Cermak, one of the paramedics from the LA County Fire Department, would testify in court about Gabriel's appearance, saying, quote, it was just like every inch of this child had been abused. They attempted CPR and injected Gabriel with epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, to try to get his heart beating again. Cermak said when he and his partner were working on the body, they noted severe trauma all over Gabriel's body, including, quote, strangulation marks around his neck, bite marks, bruises head to toe, little holes as if he was shot with a BB gun. The more you looked, the more you saw. It was unbelievable. Cermak would also say that the entire time they worked on Gabriel, his mother, 29-year-old Pearl Fernandez, and her boyfriend, 32-year-old Isaro Aguirre, known as Tony, sat on the couch and exuded no emotion. He said neither of them were crying or seemed upset, still unresponsive and not breathing. Gabriel was taken to Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Emergency room nurse Christine Estes said his body showed, quote, bruising from head to toe and was, quote, literally worse than any horror movie I've seen. Two nurses in the pediatric intensive care unit would later testify that Gabriel's entire body was covered with injuries. Emily Rebar, one of the nurses, said, quote, it seemed like every inch of Gabriel was bruised and swollen. The other nurse, Jody Mercer, said that Gabriel, quote, looked like a shell of a boy. Tragically, Gabriel Fernandez was pronounced brain dead later that day. Pearl Fernandez, the mother of Gabriel, Ezekiel, and 10-year-old Virginia, told the LA County Sheriff deputies that Gabriel had been jumping on a bed with Ezekiel, fell off the bed, and hit his head on a dresser. She claimed that his other wounds were self-inflicted. Deputy Ronald McCarthy, one of the officers who questioned the couple, described Pearl's demeanor as, quote, disinterested when she spoke with him. McCarthy said Pearl only showed concern when she spoke about not wanting to leave the family's seven cats in a cage when she left to go to the hospital. When McCarthy asked Aguirre what happened, he was told that Gabriel was an angry young boy who often hurt himself. He also added that Gabriel had been in an accident on his bicycle a few days before. Detective Elliot Uribe interviewed Aguirre three times that day. He would later say that he believed Aguirre was lying the first time they spoke, but as they continued to talk, he thought Aguirre became more truthful. Aguirre said his relationship with Pearl's three children was good. When asked specifically about Gabriel, he said that Gabriel's behavior often angered him. On the evening in question, Aguirre said when Pearl told him that Gabriel wanted her to break up with him, he flew into a rage. He said he talked to Gabriel, who denied saying he wanted his mother to break up with him. Still, Aguirre began beating young Gabriel. Uribe asked Aguirre how many times he hit Gabriel. Aguirre said 10 times in the head, 20 times in the body, but he eventually lost count. Aguirre said that when he realized Gabriel wasn't breathing, he tried to help him saying, when I took him out, I could hear bubbles or air bubbles. So I told her to get me the phone so I could call 911. She did. So I had them on speaker 
and they were helping me to do compressions, you know, CPR. Uribe said that he didn't feel that Aguirre was telling the truth about trying to save Gabriel. Aguirre eventually admitted that he beat Gabriel for lying and, quote, being dirty. When police spoke to Gabriel's 12-year-old brother, Ezekiel, he told them that his mother instructed him to say that he and Gabriel were playing on the bed and his brother fell, hitting his head on the dresser. He admitted that he did what he was told because he was afraid of getting beaten if he didn't comply. The following day, Friday, May 24th, Gabriel was taken off life support at Children's Hospital. The charges against Aguirre and Fernandez would now include murder. Police were confident they could show that Gabriel's mother and Aguirre had beaten him to death, but they could not imagine what else their investigation would begin to unravel. The boy had been tortured and beaten mercilessly for months. Ezekiel said that the beating on May 22nd began after Gabriel would not pick up his toys. He said his mother told Aguirre that Gabriel had asked her to end her relationship with Aguirre and promised to act better if she did. Pearl then began hitting Gabriel and dragged him into the bedroom. Aguirre entered the bedroom, at which time Ezekiel said his brother was screaming, and then he heard thumps and pounding, saying, quote, and that's when it all stopped. It just went quiet. Virginia, Gabriel's 10-year-old sister, said that she had been sitting on the bed, frozen in fear, while her mother and Aguirre beat her brother to death right in front of her. She said that her mother told her to clean up Gabriel's blood, which was all over the walls and floor. Pearl and Aguirre came up with a story that Gabriel had been playing on their bed and hit his head. As this false story was being concocted, Virginia's little brother lay motionless on the floor. Allegedly, Aguirre then put Gabriel in the shower to try to revive him. Paramedics found Gabriel naked and wet on the floor when they arrived. Two days were spent on Gabriel's autopsy, which is an unusually long period of time. The autopsy findings were chilling. Cat litter and animal hair were found inside of Gabriel's stomach. The coroner said that his thymus gland had shrunk, quote, from being starved. Dr. James Rebe from the coroner's office said that he found a BB pellet in Gabriel's lung and seven others from different areas of his body, including his groin. His cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma and neglect. Dr. Rebe would later testify that he had never seen so many injuries on a child before. On May 28th, Fernandez and Aguirre were charged with capital murder. Gabriel had only come to live with his mother in October of 2012, just seven months before his death. Shortly after he was born, Gabriel began living with other relatives, primarily with his maternal grandparents. They had all three children for years, but in 2009, Ezekiel and Virginia went to live with Fernandez and Aguirre. Gabriel stayed with his grandparents until 2012, when Pearl regained custody of him. Pearl's parents protested and told authorities that their daughter had a history of neglect and abuse, but there was nothing they could do as Pearl had already been given custody and was allowed to take him back. Speculation arose that the reason Pearl had gotten custody of Gabriel was to collect additional welfare benefits. Soon after Gabriel moved to his mother's home, the abuse and neglect began. Ezekiel said that Gabriel was kicked in the groin by their mother. He said that Fernandez and Aguirre called his brother, quote, gay. She also hit Gabriel with a broomstick and made him wear girls' clothing to school. Gabriel used to bring boys' clothes with him and changed in the bathroom when he got to school. Fernandez would beat him when she found out about this. Ezekiel further said that Aguirre would stuff a sock in Gabriel's mouth and tie a banana around it. He said that Aguirre would apply makeup on Gabriel to cover up bruises from the beatings he gave him. He said that Aguirre hit his brother using the metal part of a belt or a computer cord. He also used a wooden club, steel-toed boots, a metal baton, and a baseball bat to beat Gabriel, and enjoyed shooting him with a BB gun and burning him with cigarettes. Investigators found BB gun holes in the walls in the family's apartment, as well as a wooden club covered in Gabriel's blood. Ezekiel also said that Fernandez and Aguirre once put Gabriel in the bathtub, and Aguirre sprayed his brother with pepper spray. He said they made Gabriel eat expired food, such as old spinach, and when his brother would vomit, 
Fernandez made him eat it. He also said the couple made Gabriel eat cat litter and cat feces. Ezekiel would sneak food to his brother and was beaten when his mother would catch him. Both Ezekiel and Virginia talked about Gabriel having to sleep in a quote, box. The box they spoke of was actually a cabinet that Fernandez and Aguirre would make Gabriel sleep in. To make sure he didn't get out, there was a pair of handcuffs attached to the inside of the cabinet. Ezekiel said that when social workers came to the apartment, Gabriel was forced to hide in the box. Shortly before he was killed, Gabriel was spending almost all day and night in the box. He said that Gabriel's missing front teeth came from the baseball bat with which Gabriel's mother hit him in the face. Fernandez and Aguirre were unable to keep the abuse they inflicted on Gabriel a secret. After Gabriel moved in with them, Jennifer Garcia, Gabriel's first grade teacher at Summerwind Elementary School, began to notice problems. Garcia said that she met Fernandez and Aguirre when they came in to register Gabriel for school. She said she was intimidated by them, saying, quote, they looked mean and I did not want to get on their bad side. She said they were not like other parents who asked a lot of questions and showed an interest in their children's schooling. Garcia said that neither Fernandez nor Aguirre asked any questions and made no small talk. Like most abused or neglected children, Gabriel yearned for attention and acceptance. He would sometimes stay in the classroom to help Garcia instead of going to recess. On October 30th, Gabriel asked Garcia during class whether it was normal for mothers to hit their children, thinking he was referring to being spanked. Garcia asked Gabriel to talk with her about it at recess. When recess began, Gabriel stayed to talk with her. He asked her if it was normal to be hit with a belt buckle until you bled. Garcia thought she should call the child abuse hotline to report this, but still thought Gabriel was talking about being spanked and worried if there was more context to what he had told her. When Garcia called the hotline, she spoke to a worker named Steve Reed, who said that what Gabriel had told her was reportable. The next day, Garcia received a call from the Department of Child and Family Services. Investigator Stephanie Rodriguez called to tell her that she had been assigned to Gabriel's case. She gave Garcia her phone number and said to call her if she heard or saw anything else. Garcia met with Pearl Fernandez for their parent-teacher conference a few days later. Nervous about being in the classroom with Fernandez, Garcia left the door open. As Garcia began to talk about Gabriel, Fernandez said out of nowhere, quote, I don't hit my kids. Garcia, who had not said anything to Fernandez about what Gabriel had told her, was not sure how to respond. She decided to go back to the prior conversation about Gabriel and how he was doing in school completely ignoring Fernandez's comment. Gabriel soon began acting out in class. He sometimes kicked other students while sitting at his desk. This behavior increased so much that Garcia had to move Gabriel's chair several times. Because of Gabriel's behavior, she began sending notes home to Fernandez. She stopped sending notes a short while later, believing that the notes were only making things worse for Gabriel at home. The Monday after Thanksgiving, Gabriel was not in class when school began. He showed up later with bloody scabs on his head and missing chunks of hair. The other kids laughed at him. Garcia took Gabriel to the principal's office to show him what happened. To her dismay, the principal told her, quote, we don't investigate, we just report what we see. Garcia called DCFS investigator Stephanie Rodriguez and left a voicemail reporting what she had seen. Garcia would leave another voice message for Rodriguez after she hadn't received a return phone call. Thursday morning, Gabriel came to school with a bloody lip. He told his teacher that his mother had punched him in the mouth. Garcia called Rodriguez again. In December, Garcia noticed things were getting worse. Gabriel would fall behind when walking with the rest of the class and would tell her that his arms and legs hurt. She would also see him crying after school telling her that he didn't want to go back home. In the beginning of 2013, Gabriel continued to miss a lot of days. He would be gone for a few days, and when he returned, there were visible injuries on his body. Summerwind School Secretary Pam Howell confronted Aguirre when he came to the school, asking about Gabriel's increased absences. His response, she would later testify, was, quote, 
He told me he was the father and he could do whatever he wanted with the kids. Although, Aguirre was not the biological father to any of Pearl Fernandez's children. At the end of January, Gabriel came in with eyes so swollen he had to squint to see. Garcia could see what she would later describe as perfect little round spots on his face. At recess, she asked him to stay behind with her, which he usually did anyway, and asked him about the spots on his face. At first, he told her he fell. When Garcia said she didn't believe him, Gabriel admitted that Fernandez had shot him in the face with a BB gun. This was the first time he had lied to Garcia. When she asked him why he didn't tell her the truth to begin with, Gabriel's response was chilling. He said, quote, because when I tell you and that lady comes, I get hurt worse. Garcia assumed the lady he was talking about was DCFS investigator Stephanie Rodriguez. This revelation made Garcia worry even more for Gabriel, but she didn't know what else she could do. DCFS and law enforcement had both been involved, but it only seemed like the abuse was getting worse. She called Rodriguez again, who told her that she could not discuss what was going on in the case. Garcia felt helpless, not knowing what to say to Gabriel. Garcia also confirmed Ezekiel and Virginia's claims that their mother would make Gabriel come to school wearing girls' clothes. Gabriel was constantly trying to do things to get his mother's approval. He would ask Garcia to give him an A on assignments so he could show his mother how well he was doing. Garcia eventually realized that when she called DCFS, Gabriel would come to school with even more severe injuries. She said, quote, I didn't want to call. I didn't know what to do. I don't know how I could look at his face and not be able to assure him that that wasn't going to happen again when I couldn't say that. She wanted to get help for Gabriel, but didn't know where to turn. She contacted the school psychologist, who said the school had no services to offer him. Instead, she gave Garcia a brochure to give to Fernandez about how to deal with a child's behavior problems. Garcia threw the brochure away, believing it would only lead to more beatings. Jennifer Garcia was not the only one who saw some of Gabriel's injuries. Parents coming to school would later report seeing bruises on him. The mother of one student said the bruises were constant, saying, quote, It's not like, oh, he had a bruise here. No, every day, every week. In late February, Ezekiel discovered some notes that Gabriel had written, saying he wanted to kill himself. One of the notes, addressed to his mother, said, quote, I love you so much that I will die. On February 27th, Fernandez discussed the notes with Carmen Lee Norgent, a therapist who had been assigned to work with the family. Lee Norgent spoke with Gabriel about the notes, and when she asked him if he was serious, he responded, quote, yes. Lee Norgent called DCFS to report this, as well as 911. A police officer came to the home in response, but left without speaking to Gabriel. The complaint was later dismissed because Gabriel did not exhibit a specific suicide plan. On March 26th, a counselor reported that Gabriel had been forced to perform oral sex on a male relative. When the report was investigated, with Pearl Fernandez in the room listening, Gabriel claimed the incident never happened. This report never appeared to be followed up on. Near the end of April, Gabriel came to school with marks on his face, neck, and ear. One of his eyes was red. He had skin on his forehead that was peeling. The class was making Mother's Day cards, and Garcia asked him if he wanted to make one. Gabriel said he did. He spent much of the day working on the card for his mother. The card was shaped like a house, and on the front it said, quote, Open the door to see who loves you. Inside the door, Gabriel had pasted a picture of himself. Garcia called Rodriguez again and left a voice message. Her call was never returned, and Rodriguez did not make a note of Garcia's phone call in Gabriel's file. On April 26th, an employee from the welfare department called DCFS to report that Gabriel had black eyes, bruises, burns, and ligature marks on him. Fernandez was at the welfare office with the children. Arturo Martinez, a security guard, saw immediately that Gabriel was injured and needed help. While in the welfare office, Fernandez had been yelling at Gabriel to sit down. Martinez had to go over and ask Fernandez to calm down. When he did, he saw cigarette burns all over Gabriel. 
He also had a black eye and a lump on the back of his head. Martinez would later testify that Gabriel's skin was, quote, almost yellow, like he's been starving or something. Martinez went to the person who was helping Fernandez and asked for Fernandez's information so he could report her. The employee, Marciela Corona, was only filling in and went to ask her supervisor for permission. She came back and told Martinez that she could not give him Fernandez's information. Martinez then called his supervisor, who told him, quote, that's not your job, it's not part of your duties. Martinez went back to his desk. Corona later came over and gave him a piece of paper with the family's information on it and asked Martinez to, quote, save this kid. Feeling encouraged, Martinez called DCFS but got stuck in their automated system. He hung up and called again, with the same result. Frustrated, he called 911, but the operator said it didn't sound like an emergency and told him to call the non-emergency number. He called the non-emergency number and was told that a deputy had gone to the home but didn't see any problems. Martinez requested to be transferred somewhere else, telling his supervisor that he could not work with people who didn't want to help in a situation like this. A few days later, Gabriel told Garcia that his eye was hurting. Garcia sent him to the school nurse. Gabriel told the nurse that he fell off his bike. The nurse, Donna Evans, was brand new at the school. The school nurses were not authorized to give medical care, so she called Fernandez to come pick up Gabriel, despite Gabriel's pleas to let him stay. Evans wrote detailed notes regarding the incident, in case DCFS would want to investigate the incident. When Fernandez arrived to take her son home, Pam Howell, the secretary, knew this was a big mistake. In May of 2013, after Gabriel had not been at school for several days, Garcia said that Fernandez and Aguirre told her that he had gone to Texas to live with his grandmother. Garcia didn't believe their story. A sheriff's deputy visited the address listed for Gabriel in the school's records, but it was actually the address of Aguirre's parents. When the deputy was able to get in touch with Fernandez, she told him that Gabriel was living with family in Texas. Gabriel would never attend another day at Summerwind Elementary School. On May 23rd, Jennifer Garcia was called to the principal's office where she was informed that Gabriel had died the day before, although Gabriel was still on life support at that time. Another person in the office said that Gabriel was at Children's Hospital, which made Garcia think he might still be alive. She called the hospital to check on his condition and asked if she could visit him, but they were not allowed to give her any information. Garcia said of that day, quote, I just pictured him being alone. I wanted to go there and hold his hand and say, you're going to be okay. You survived, it's over now. She would later find out that Gabriel had been declared brain dead the day before. Garcia walked back to her classroom, waiting for her students to arrive. When school started, she told the class that Gabriel had been seriously hurt by his mother. The students could not comprehend how a mother could hurt her child. Garcia said, quote, they just couldn't wrap their heads around it. A few days after his death, Garcia found a note in Gabriel's desk that said, quote, I love you, mom, and Gabriel's a good boy. It would later be learned that Fernandez cut off any further visits with DCFS in March of 2013, saying she didn't need their help any further. Apparently, the program they were participating in was voluntary. On November 15th, Aguirre went on trial for first-degree murder, along with a special circumstance allegation of murder involving torture. If convicted of the special circumstance, Aguirre would be eligible for the death penalty. During the grand jury hearing, Deputy Assistant District Attorney Jonathan Hatami told the jury that Fernandez and Aguirre covered up their abuse by using fake doctor's notes and telling lies to the school. Hatami said, quote, For eight straight months, he was abused, beaten, and tortured more severely than many prisoners of war. Siblings Ezekiel and Virginia testified at the grand jury hearing to talk about the horror their younger brother endured for the entire time he lived with his mother and Aguirre. They testified that Gabriel was brutalized by the pair, making him sleep in the box and not letting him out to go to the bathroom. They said he was made to eat cat feces, rotten food, and even his own vomit if he threw up. They said he was constantly called gay 
and sometimes dressed like a girl and sent to school. Indictments for Fernandez and Aguirre were returned by the grand jury on July 28, 2014. Fernandez and Aguirre were set to be tried separately. Both were given offers of life without the possibility of parole, with no right to appeal, in exchange for a guilty plea. They had until their hearing on December 3rd of 2014 to accept the offer. On October 22nd, news outlets reported that both defendants had agreed to plead guilty to murder and torture charges in return for a life sentence without parole. However, on October 30th, it was reported that Aguirre had not accepted the plea and that he would take his chances at trial. Fernandez did accept the plea and her sentencing date would come in February of 2018. Virginia and Ezekiel did not want to have to testify against their mother and had asked Hatami to accept the plea deal. Fernandez's attorneys, Michael Schensel and Julia Dixon, were unhappy with their client's sentence, stating that her low intellectual ability should mitigate her punishment. The defense team presented records from a cognitive ability test that Fernandez took in 2011. She scored in the third percentile in the verbal comprehension portion of the test, indicating that she functioned at a second grade level. Clinical and forensic neuropsychologist Deborah Miora was called to the stand. She had been retained by the defense to evaluate Fernandez. Miora said that Fernandez had an intellectual disability that made her, quote, virtually unable to use thought to guide her behavior and temper her emotional reactions. According to her evaluation with Fernandez, Miori said that Fernandez's life was full of abuse. She said her father had been in and out of jail and claimed that her mother hated her. She started drinking and using methamphetamines by the time she was nine years old. She ran away when she was 11. Fernandez told Miora that an uncle tried to rape her when she was a teenager. Fernandez also said she was kidnapped by a group of men who raped her. She said her former boyfriends beat her, one of them even pistol whipped her. She claimed that Aguirre was also physically abusive to her during their relationship. She told Miora that she had been using opioids during the time Gabriel lived with her. Aguirre's family maintained that Fernandez was the guilty one. Aguirre's mother told reporters that her son was innocent of the charges. One of Aguirre's cousins, who chose to remain anonymous, said, quote, he loved those kids. She did it, and everybody knows she did it. Even her family knows she did it. Superior Court Judge George Lomelli would hear the case. Assistant District Attorney Jonathan Hatami would be the main prosecutor, with assistance by Assistant District Attorney Scott Yang. Before opening statements began, the gallery was told that since this was such a disturbing case, everyone would be expected to keep calm or the bailiff would escort them out. Hatami began by showing the jury a picture of Gabriel when he lived with his maternal grandparents before Fernandez got custody of him. He then showed them a picture of Gabriel in his bed at Children's Hospital and said, quote, This case is about one thing, and that is the systematic torture of a helpless and innocent child. After eight months of living with the defendant, his body was battered. The evidence will show he was beaten, burned, bruised. He said that the six foot two, 270 pound Aguirre knew how to use pepper spray and batons from his previous work as a security guard, and that these were two of the weapons he used on the four foot one, 59 pound Gabriel. Hatami began to describe how Aguirre and Fernandez worked together, saying, quote, to deceive everyone in order to torture Gabriel to death. He told them how Gabriel was subjected to sleeping tied up with a sock in his mouth, covered by a bandana in a small cabinet. While this horrible image was sinking in, Hatami walked over to a large, covered object in the courtroom and pulled off the sheet to reveal, quote, the box where Gabriel was forced to sleep at night. Hatami said, quote, this wasn't about drugs, this wasn't about mental health issues. Aguirre did it because he didn't like him. He believed Gabriel was gay, and to him, that was a bad thing. He did it out of hatred of a little boy. 
He said that Fernandez and Aguirre had beaten Gabriel so relentlessly on May 22nd that he was close to death, but the caretakers continued to beat and punch the boy, Aguirre going so far as to push Gabriel's head into a wall. Tiffany Hsu, one of the criminalists working on the case, was called to testify. She showed the court a photo of the family's home. On it, they could see literally hundreds of bloodstains on the wall, as well as marks where Gabriel had been thrown into the wall. She said there were so many blood spatters in the room, she ran out of stickers to mark them. When asked about the blood, she said that DNA tests were run on items found in the home that had blood on them. The results showed Gabriel's blood on a wooden club, baseball bat, and a computer cord. She also said that Gabriel's DNA was found inside the cabinet where he had been sleeping at night. Stefan Schliebe, another criminalist, told the jury about what was found in Gabriel's stomach. He said the contents were so similar to cat litter that he could not tell them apart. A falsified doctor's note was also shown to the jury to keep Gabriel out of school. L.A. County Sheriff's Deputy Jonathan Beck testified that Gabriel, quote, had cigarette burns on his body, bruising throughout his entire body, and it looked like his penis, someone attempted to cut it off. Emily Rebar, a nurse at Children's Hospital who was working when Gabriel was admitted, said, quote, every inch of Gabriel was bruised and swollen. His skin was kind of a black and blue color. I remember he felt cold to the touch. She cried as she described seeing Gabriel on life support, laying in his hospital bed, with a breathing tube keeping him alive. When asked about Deputy Beck's claim that it looked like someone had tried to cut Gabriel's penis off, Rebar said she did not remember seeing that, and that if she did, she would have documented it. Assistant District Attorney Scott Yang called to the stand Senior Deputy Medical Examiner James Rebe, who performed the autopsy on Gabriel. Rebe told the jury that Gabriel had injuries from his head to the bottom of his feet. He said there were 10 spots on Gabriel's head where patches of his hair were torn out. Gabriel had two teeth knocked out and several rib fractures, some that were recent and others that had started to heal before he died. Rebe said that the various injuries on Gabriel's body could have occurred at any time from weeks to years before his death. Regarding the BB found in Gabriel's lung, Rebe said that it had to have been inhaled or swallowed. Although Fernandez and Aguirre had claimed that Gabriel's injuries were self-inflicted, Rebe said that was not possible. He said that Gabriel had not received any medical treatment for his injuries and was extremely malnourished. Yang asked Rebe, quote, so Gabriel wasn't being fed? Rebe, quote, correct. On cross-exam, defense attorney Michael Scalar asked Rebe if Gabriel's injuries were consistent with the, quote, explosion of violence. Rebe's answer was, quote, I think they are. Arturo Martinez, the security guard for L.A. County Public Social Services, told the jury he saw Gabriel in the office on April 26, 2013, and noticed the boy had a black eye and bruises all over him. He said he could see cigarette burns on him as well. He said, quote, I probably saw about 17 to 23 burns. Martinez said some of the burns looked old and others looked new. He also said that Gabriel's skin looked yellow and that he was so thin that his head looked bigger than his body. When shown a picture of Pearl Fernandez, Martinez identified her as the woman with Gabriel that day. He said that she was yelling at him to sit down and one of the siblings told him that his mother was going to, quote, get him if he didn't do it. He said that Fernandez saw him looking at Gabriel and got in front of him so that Martinez could no longer see him. Martinez said, quote, she noticed me observing him and she didn't like that. Martinez then spoke about the issue regarding his attempt to get someone to help Gabriel. His 911 call was played to the jury as well as his call to police. On day three of trial, Gabriel's brother Ezekiel took the stand. The now 16-year-old told the court he tried not to remember the things that were done to his younger brother because it upset him. Prompted by transcripts of his grand jury testimony, he was able to recall many instances of torture and abuse that his mother and Aguirre inflicted on Gabriel. 
Hatami talked to Ezekiel about what the teenager referred to as, quote, the box, the cabinet where Gabriel had been forced to sleep. Ezekiel said that Aguirre tied up his younger brother and forced him to sleep in the cabinet. He said that in the last weeks of Gabriel's life, he was kept locked up in the box during the day as well. Ezekiel said that when DCFS investigators came to the home, Gabriel was put inside the cabinet so his injuries could not be seen. He told the jury about Aguirre beating Gabriel with the metal buckle of his belt, a metal coat hanger, a wooden club, and a baseball bat. He also said that Aguirre shot Gabriel in the face and body with a BB gun, adding that the abuse pretty much occurred on a daily basis. He remembered Aguirre punching Gabriel, then picking him up by the neck and holding him up against the wall until he passed out. Then Aguirre would drop the unconscious boy, letting him fall to the floor. He also said that Aguirre would pepper spray Gabriel and have him take off his clothes to beat him with a belt buckle and a metal hanger. He said that Aguirre enjoyed calling Gabriel gay when he tortured him. When asked how his mother treated Gabriel, Ezekiel said that he saw her kick his brother in the groin. She also hit him with a broomstick and beat and kicked him. He said that she sometimes made Gabriel wear girls' clothes to school and was once beaten by her when she discovered that he had changed his clothes in the school bathroom. Ezekiel went on to say that his mother and Aguirre would gang up on his eight-year-old brother to beat him up. He also said they would laugh at Gabriel while they beat him. He said he was warned not to talk about the abuse he witnessed and that if he didn't lie about Gabriel's injuries and say he hurt himself while he was playing, he would also be beaten. As if it couldn't get any worse, Ezekiel told the court that Fernandez and Aguirre once told him to hit his own brother. He said he didn't actually hit Gabriel, but only pretended to, and that he whispered to his brother to fall to make it look real. Ezekiel said that Gabriel was the only one in the home who was beaten. He said that his brother had toys withheld from him and wasn't allowed to play with friends. He said he didn't understand why Fernandez and Aguirre treated Gabriel the way they did. When Hatami asked Ezekiel about the day his brother died, he said that Fernandez and Aguirre hit Gabriel over and over, drawing blood. His mother dragged Gabriel into the bathroom, followed by Aguirre, and closed the door. Ezekiel heard his brother screaming and then heard banging, and then nothing but silence. As he had during the grand jury procedures, Assistant District Attorney Hatami walked Ezekiel through how the abuse Fernandez and Aguirre inflicted on his brother extended to food. Ezekiel said his mother and Aguirre fed Gabriel things like cat litter and cat feces. He remembered one time when Gabriel had to eat spoiled spinach. He said, quote, My mom and her boyfriend made Gabriel eat spoiled stuff or expired stuff. One thing I remember is expired spinach. He threw it up and they made him eat it off the table. Throughout Ezekiel's entire testimony, Aguirre sat in his chair with no expression on his face. He would not even look up at Ezekiel while he testified. 14-year-old Virginia was called next. When Hatami showed her a picture of her little brother, she began to cry. After a short break, she told the court that Aguirre constantly beat her brother and said that her mother knocked out Gabriel's two front teeth with a broomstick. She said Gabriel was beaten often and that Aguirre liked to shoot him with a BB gun. As she described the nightmare that Gabriel experienced, crying could be heard throughout the courtroom, coming from both the gallery and the jury. Virginia told similar stories of the abuse that Ezekiel had described the day before and said the beatings happened constantly. When asked if Aguirre made Gabriel sleep in the cabinet, she looked over at the piece of furniture sitting ominously in the courtroom and said, quote, yes, a lot. She confirmed that handcuffs were attached to the inside of the cabinet so Gabriel could not get out. Virginia also remembered her mother making Gabriel go to school wearing girls clothing and both Fernandez and Aguirre calling him gay. When asked about the night of May 22nd, 2013, Virginia said, quote, I was sitting on the edge of the bed and my mother's boyfriend was punching him through tears, she said that Aguirre wouldn't stop hitting Gabriel. She said, quote, he had knocked the air out of him and he fell over and didn't get back up. So they picked him up, they threw him in the shower, and they kept yelling at him to wake up. When he didn't wake up, 
my mother decided to call the police. On the prosecution's first day, Gabriel's maternal grandfather, Robert Fernandez, was called. He told them that Gabriel had lived with he and his late wife, Sandra, for seven and a half years. He said that Aguirre had taken Gabriel from them, even though they were the ones with custody. It seems that although Gabriel's grandparents had been granted custody years before, Pearl may have taken steps to regain it. Years before, for a short time, Pearl and her three children stayed with them. Robert said that he tried to get Pearl to bond with Gabriel, but it never happened. Robert told the court that Aguirre had asked to have Gabriel come with them to a barbecue at Aguirre's parents' home. He said Sandra did not want to allow it, but they eventually let Gabriel go with them. To verify Gabriel's story, Robert drove over to the home of Aguirre's parents, but there was no barbecue going on in the yard. Robert went back to his home and called Aguirre for an explanation. He said Aguirre had told him the barbecue was inside the house. Sandra called 911 and told police that Fernandez and Aguirre had taken Gabriel, but nothing was done about it. Robert said from that day in October, when Aguirre and Fernandez took Gabriel and the following May, when Gabriel died, he only saw his grandson two or three times. He said Gabriel wanted to come back home to them, but Robert could only ask him to wait as DCFS was investigating. He promised Gabriel that they would bring him back home, but that day would never come. Aguirre was represented by defense attorneys Michael Scalar and John Allen. The defense was not a case of trying to get the jury to acquit Aguirre, as he had already admitted to killing Gabriel. There was also an overwhelming amount of evidence, both physical and witness testimony, against Aguirre. Their job was going to be to try and save him from the death penalty. In his opening argument, John Allen said that Aguirre had beaten Gabriel, causing the boy's death. However, he said that Aguirre did not mean to kill Gabriel. Instead, he claimed Aguirre beat Gabriel in a fit of rage and he died accidentally. Allen said, quote, Isaro immediately began performing CPR and told Pearl to call 911. Isaro took the phone and requested emergency medical help for his son, who was not breathing. Allen said that Aguirre performed CPR to try and save Gabriel, and he, quote, carefully followed the 911 operator's instructions. Allen said that Aguirre's attempts to save Gabriel were, quote, not the actions of a person who ever wanted Gabriel to die. Once you've heard the evidence in this case, you will find Gabriel was tortured, abused, and neglected, that he sorrow, committed the crime of murder, but the special circumstance allegation is not true. The prosecution had previously shown a video of one of Aguirre's interviews to the jury. When it was the defense's turn, they told the court that the prosecution had only shown clips of the interview, which showed Aguirre in the worst possible light. They requested that the entire video be played, but the judge denied their request. Scalar did show some parts of Aguirre's interviews, one where Aguirre was asked about his frustration and anger on a scale of 1 to 10 when he beat Gabriel on May 22nd. Aguirre's answer was 20. Other parts of the video showed Aguirre crying and wiping his tears on his shirt. In one part of the interview, he says, quote, I just want to go see him. The defense pointed the blame on Fernandez for Gabriel's death, saying that she manipulated and controlled Aguirre. They put witnesses on the stand to show what a poor and uncaring mother she was. Pilar Rios was called to the stand. Pilar was the mother of Luis Rios, who had a daughter named Destiny with Fernandez. She said that when Destiny was an infant, Fernandez fed her junk food and gave her soda to drink. Pilar said, quote, she didn't give her formula the way you should with a newborn child. She would give her soda, colas, and juices. She said Fernandez would feed fast food to Destiny, which would make her throw up, and that the little girl's clothes were dirty and covered in vomit. Destiny's father, Luis Rios, said he did not like to leave his daughter with Fernandez due to her poor parenting skills. The defense used this to try to establish that Fernandez had developed a pattern of being a negligent mother by the time Gabriel had come to live with her. Gabriel's paternal grandparents, Placida and Rodrigo Contreras, 
testified about their feelings regarding Fernandez's parenting. Although neither of them had witnessed Fernandez hit Gabriel, they did see injuries to Arnold Contreras, the older brother of Gabriel, who had been adopted by them because Fernandez had basically abandoned him. Rodrigo Contreras said, quote, She told us that she did not love Arnold because she suffered so much during his delivery, that she did not love him, and that this is why she gave him to us. Scalar and Allen had four witnesses they wanted to call who would testify about Aguirre's poor learning skills. The witnesses were going to talk about his poor grades and being held back in the ninth grade. He also had problems learning at his job at McDonald's when he was 18 years old. Judge Lomali told the defense attorneys that they would need to have an expert testify that Aguirre's learning problems would not have allowed him to participate in the planning of Gabriel's abuse. Unfortunately, the defense did not have an expert to call and the witnesses were not allowed. Michael Scalar told the jury that, unlike how the prosecution portrayed him, Aguirre was not an evil person. He discussed Aguirre's previous employment at a nursing home where he was well-liked and good at his job. He also pointed out that Aguirre had no previous criminal record. Scalar said that his client went into an uncontrollable rage on May 22nd after Fernandez told him that Gabriel had asked her to leave Aguirre. Gabriel denied saying these things and called his mother a liar, and Aguirre, quote, exploded in a rage of anger. He admitted that Aguirre beat Gabriel to death, but explained that he did so because he lost complete control of himself. He said that as soon as he realized Gabriel was unconscious, he told Fernandez to call 911, even though he knew that it meant he would go to prison for what he had done. Scalar said that it was Fernandez, not Aguirre, who beat her son with a belt, shot BBs at his face and body, and was the one who had been abusing Gabriel for so long. The last witness was William Adams, a consultant for the California Department of Corrections. Adams was asked to describe how Aguirre would fare if sentenced to life without parole. He answered that he thought Aguirre would be, quote, more likely to be prey than predator. On cross, when asked what his personal opinion of Aguirre's actions was, Adams said that he thought what the defendant did was, quote, evil. Closing arguments began on November 13, 2017. When the case was handed over to the jury, they asked for testimony of William Adams to be read back to them, which was granted. They also asked for transcripts of the closing arguments. This was denied by Judge Lomali, reminding the jury that opening and closing arguments are not evidence. The jury only took five hours to reach their verdict. On November 15, 2017, four and a half years after Gabriel's death, Isaro Aguirre was convicted of first-degree murder with special circumstances for the torture of Gabriel, which made him eligible for the death penalty. The defense filed a motion for a mistrial due to statements that Hatami had made. Hatami, a victim of abuse himself, told reporters about his childhood. Scalar and Allen asked for Hatami to be recused for his remarks if the mistrial was granted. Allen told the court, quote, the various statements that the prosecutor made to the media indicating his own experience as a child abuse victim, his display of emotion, wiping tears away from his eyes, was proof that he could not prosecute the case fairly. Judge Lomelli denied the motion and the request, telling both sides that the jury instructions included telling jurors to avoid any media information about the trial. He did tell the attorneys that he would not tolerate comments like those Hatami made to the media while the trial was still going on. The penalty phase of the trial lasted for two weeks. Assistant District Attorney Yang told the jury that they would hear, quote, about the severity of the crime, the severity of the injuries to a helpless child, the impact of Gabriel Fernandez's death on those who knew him and those who loved him. And it's going to be about the defendant's lack of remorse immediately after he killed Gabriel. He further told them that Gabriel's maternal grandparents were the only parents the child had ever had and that Aguirre and Fernandez had taken Gabriel away from them in order to collect additional welfare. Once he came to live with them, the abuse and neglect he suffered at their hands led to his death. Yang said, quote, 
and for eight months he was abused. He was tortured and he was beaten. Like a prisoner of war at the hands of the defendant, Yang reminded the jury of some of the ways Aguirre had tortured Gabriel and said that the eight-year-old's, quote, last vision was of his mother and the defendant standing over him, kicking and punching him to death. Hatami showed pictures to the jury of Gabriel's injuries and told them that death was the, quote, only appropriated and just punishment. Hatami repeated evidence from the trial saying, quote, there is nothing worse in our society than a grown man murdering and torturing an innocent little boy stuffed in that box, cold, afraid, lonely, hungry, probably hard to breathe. Hatami reminded the jury that Gabriel was not let out to go to the bathroom on a regular basis and, quote, defecated and urinated in that box. The defendant broke Gabriel's spirit. Hatami continued. He said Aguirre, quote, beat Gabriel to death with his fists, his hands, in front of Gabriel's own brother and sister. What type of man would do that? Not a man with any goodness in him. His emaciated little body had nine metal BBs in it, a lacerated liver, a fractured skull, whip marks on his back, unimaginable pain and suffering at the hands of the defendant. What type of man would punch a child 10 times in the face? Not a man with any goodness in him. Death was likely a merciful end to Gabriel's pain and suffering. Gabriel's brother Ezekiel and his sister Virginia testified again so the jury would remember the torture and murder of their younger brother, which they witnessed and could do nothing to prevent. Jennifer Garcia, Gabriel's teacher, who had done so much to try to help Gabriel, said that she thought about him every day. She said, quote, I find comfort in believing he is now at peace, and I know that unlike him, his abusers will never have peace. They will have a lifetime of suffering to endure, and I know I'm not alone in hoping they experience the same abuse in their lifetime and worse. They are evil people for what they did. She told the jury that she had to explain to her class why Gabriel would not be coming back again. Garcia assigns each of her students a number each year. Gabriel's number was 28. She does not give students that number any longer, preferring to keep it Gabriel's number in remembrance of him. When new students inquire, she has to explain to them who Gabriel was and why there is no number 28 in their class. Gabriel's biological father, Arnold Contreras, who was in jail when he learned that his son had died, testified that he felt guilty for not being there for Gabriel when he died. Contreras said that Fernandez never showed any affection for Gabriel, and he did not want his son living with her in Aguirre. He had been told that Gabriel would be living with Robert and Sandra, but found out later that Fernandez had, quote, taken him away to her home. Gabriel's uncle, Christopher Contreras, who had served in the military, said that he had seen horrible things in combat but what his nephew endured at the hand of Fernandez and Aguirre, quote, made it nothing. He told the jury that he still remembers how Gabriel looked in the hospital before being taken off life support, and that is his last memory of his nephew. Assistant District Attorney Yang summarized by saying, quote, when you consider all of the evidence and the callousness of this defendant during an eight-month period, it will outweigh all of the mitigation. Yang said that Aguirre's action should give him a sentence of, quote, nothing less than death. Michael Sklar told the jury that even though he believed his client was guilty of second-degree murder, he respected the guilty verdict for first-degree murder with special circumstances they had handed down to his client. However, he told them that a death sentence for Aguirre would be, quote, grossly disproportionate to his guilt. A woman in the gallery could be heard whispering, quote, are you serious? Defense attorney Scalar asked the jury to look at his client's entire life, which included no prior convictions and no history of violence, instead of concentrating solely on the events of May 22, 2013. Scalar said to the jury, the law never requires a death sentence, even for the worst crimes imaginable. We'll be asking you to punish Isaro Aguirre severely. He said a much more fitting punishment for the defendant was life in prison, where he would be, quote, waking up every morning in a prison cell. 
He told the jury that his client had been held back in 9th and 11th grade and dropped out of high school. He said, quote, Isaro is simple. He's slow and he's easily led, but he did the best he could until he met Pearl. Scalar said that residents of the nursing home where Aguirre used to work thought of him as, quote, gentle, kind, and patient. He said they were shocked to find out about the crime for which he was on trial. Scalar said that as a child, Aguirre was considered the, quote, peacemaker in his family and obeyed the rules of his parents. He said, quote, this is who he is before he met Pearl, and this is who he is today. He informed the jury that Aguirre had been a model inmate in jail, but that Fernandez had been charged with assaulting a guard and getting into a fight with another inmate. Scalar asked the jury for, quote, a verdict that serves the ends of justice. Follow the law down the path it takes you. Do what is right and just. The defense called two of Aguirre's younger sisters to testify. They both said they did not feel that Aguirre was guilty of the murder. The defense called former co-workers of Aguirre, who worked with him at the nursing home years before. They described him as treating the patients well and that he cared about those he provided care. Defense attorney John Allen said that Pearl Fernandez was, quote, violent, abusive, and neglected her children even before she met Isaro. Even her own family considered her a danger to her children. I don't think we'll ever truly understand how that person, referring to Aguirre, gentle, kind, patient, respectful, came to commit this horrific crime. I believe that the answer, at least in part, lies where Isaro's life intersected with Pearl's. He ended his closing statement by saying, quote, the death penalty is not required for even the most heinous crime. While the jury deliberated Aguirre's fate, a note was given to the judge. The jury asked what would happen if they could not reach a unanimous verdict. A hearing was held the next morning. Judge Lomelli told the jury that they had not yet spent enough time in deliberations to answer that question. The judge sent jurors back to the jury room to deliberate further. After seven hours of deliberation over parts of three days, the jury had reached a decision. On December 13th, 2017, the jury recommended a sentence of death for Isaro Aguirre. The sentencing hearing would not be held for another six months. Ishers, I know you've heard of meal delivery services. How about trying one where meals cost about the same as your favorite bougie latte? Every plate is America's best value meal kit with meals that cost only $4.99 per serving. Every plate recipes come together in about 30 minutes, which gives you more time to binge Dateline and spend more time with your family, of course. Every plate does the meal planning, shopping, and prepping for you and meals come with all ingredients pre-measured. I mean, you can practically cook these meals with your eyes closed, although I don't recommend that. I've cooked several every plate meals and I'm happy to report I'm now a Michelin star chef, in my own mind, but whatever, that's beside the point. One of my favorite every plate meals is the pepper jack grilled cheese with creamy roasted tomato soup. My family loves the chimichurri steak with roasted sweet potatoes poblano and onion ishers do you want to become a dinner time hero now you can for six free meals across your first three weeks and free shipping on your first delivery go to everyplate.com and enter promo code murderish six that's everyplate.com promo code murderish and the number six On June 7th, 2018, Isaro Aguirre and Pearl Fernandez were back in court for sentencing. Before the sentence was given, Fernandez was allowed to speak. She read from a prepared statement, apologizing and saying she hopes Ezekiel and Virginia will be able to forgive her someday. In a tone that showed no emotion, she told the court, quote, I want to say I'm sorry to my family for what I did. I wish Gabriel was alive. Every day, I wish I made better choices. I wish I could have saved Gabriel. 
She also took the time to criticize family members who had spoken out against her, saying that she thought they only spoke out against her because they wanted to become famous. Out of character, Judge Lomali, who typically makes no comments before sentencing, spoke directly to the defendants about his feelings towards them, saying that a case like Gabriel's, quote, almost demands a comment. He talked about some of the evidence he heard at trial, Fernandez knocking Gabriel's teeth out with a bat, and both Fernandez and Aguirre shooting the eight-year-old with a BB gun. The judge said that some people would call their behavior, quote, animalistic, but animals do not kill their family members. He continued saying, quote, it goes without saying that the conduct was horrendous and inhumane and nothing short of evil. It's beyond animalistic because animals know how to take care of their young. Uh, the repeated beatings, burning, starving, binding, uh, shooting Gabriel with uh, BBs that were embedded in different parts of his body, knocking his teeth out with a bat, uh, locking him in a dark cabinet while he's bound, and starving this, this poor child. I, I, it is unimaginable the pain that this child probably endured. And uh, from what I heard, Gabriel was a, a, a kind, loving individual who just wanted to be loved. You know, I can only wish, I, I really do, that you both, in the middle of the night, you wake up and you think of the injuries that, that you subjected this poor young man and that it tortures you. Witness impact statements came next. Gabriel's cousin, Emily Carranza, asked Fernandez, quote, Gabriel loved you. The world fell in love with Gabriel as their own. Why couldn't you? Afterward, Jennifer Garcia, Gabriel's teacher, said that she views the world differently after what happened to Gabriel. She said that she sometimes hears one of her students comment, quote, number 28, that's Gabriel's number. In June of 2016, Gabriel's family members, his father, grandparents, siblings, and four other relatives filed two lawsuits, one against Los Angeles County for DCFS and Public Social Services, and the second suit was against Palmdale School District. The family member's suit claimed that both institutions were culpable in Gabriel's death. The complaint stated that even though 60 reports were received regarding Gabriel's abuse, and that although DCFS visited the family home numerous times, nothing was done to help him. The complaint also said that after abandoning Gabriel for over seven years, Fernandez gained custody of him for the welfare benefits she could receive. Furthermore, the suits claim that a Department of Public Social Services employee failed to make a mandated report to the DCFS hotline, which contributed to Gabriel's death. The cases settled out of court. Los Angeles County agreed to pay the plaintiffs $1.98 million dollars and Palmdale School District agreed to pay $20,000. Due to the outrage voiced by many citizens in and around Palmdale area, an investigation was initiated to look into the actions of Los Angeles County DCFS and the Department of Public Social Services and Law Enforcement in Gabriel's case. An investigation was conducted into the handling of Gabriel's case by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department the investigation centered on nine deputies who visited the home or spoke to Gabriel or his family but found no reason to take action. After Jennifer Garcia's call to the abuse hotline on October 30th, 2012, when Gabriel told her that his mother hit him with a belt buckle, Deputy Imelda Rizzo visited the home but found nothing to corroborate any findings of abuse. Rizzo also failed to make a report regarding her visit to the home. If a report is not filed, investigations cannot be opened. On January 29, 2013, Gabriel came to school with bruises and a swollen eye. He said that his mother had shot him with a BB gun. Garcia called the hotline, but there is no record of the sheriff's office ever sending anyone to the home. On February 27, 2013, Gabriel's therapist, Carmen Lee Norgent, called the hotline because Gabriel's brother, Ezekiel, found notes written by Gabriel saying he wanted to kill himself. Following up on the potential suicide threat, Deputy Federico Gonzalez went to the home around 2 a.m., but Aguirre told him that Gabriel was fine. Gonzalez decided that since Gabriel did not have an actual plan to kill himself, he simply told Fernandez to watch her son for more signs. 
According to the report, Deputy Gonzalez did not speak with Gabriel during the home visit. Later, Deputy Vanessa Reddy was called to investigate a claim that Gabriel had made about being sexually abused by an uncle. Reddy interviewed Gabriel, but did not file a report that would have continued the investigation. She also did not speak with the uncle that Gabriel had accused. In early May of 2013, just before Gabriel died, Deputy Jonathan Livingston responded to a complaint that Gabriel had come to school with a swollen eye, saying that he had fallen off his bike. Livingston went to Gabriel's home and spoke with the young boy in Aguirre. Livingston found no evidence of abuse because Gabriel claimed that he had gotten his injury by falling off of his bike. Deputy Livingston did not file a report after the visit. Also in May, Gabriel had his picture taken for a Mother's Day project to surprise Fernandez. In the photo, it's hard to ignore the black eye, bruises, and skin peeling off Gabriel's forehead. He told his teacher that he had fallen off of his bike again. Garcia knew better, so she called the hotline and apparently no action was taken. On May 16th, after Gabriel had not been in school for several days, Deputy Jason Lee Lasley came to the school to investigate. Deputy Lasley spoke with Fernandez, who told him that Gabriel had gone to Texas to live with grandparents. Lasley concluded his investigation and did not file a report. None of the deputies were prosecuted for their roles in Gabriel's case, but the sheriff's department stated that all of them were disciplined internally. California law does not allow internal discipline to be disclosed but all nine deputies remained on the force. LA County DCFS had been criticized for the perceived relaxed treatment of investigators who failed to protect children in situations like Gabriel's. An internal review of the department in the last 15 cases where children had died from abuse, not one worker had been fired. Between January 2012 and August 2013, 64 children died due to abuse and or neglect in Los Angeles County. Some cases were never brought to the attention of DCFS, but the department had been involved in other cases for years before the deaths occurred. Gabriel's case was not the first time that Pearl Fernandez had been reported to social services. In 2003, Arnold Contreras, Pearl's oldest son, was injured in a motor vehicle accident it was determined that he had not been wearing a seatbelt, which resulted in a report of neglect being filed. In 2004, a relative of the family reported to DCFS that Fernandez did not want Arnold and that she constantly beat him. Another report was made in 2007, which claimed that Fernandez's daughter was not being fed and that Fernandez had told her daughter she would break her jaw when she cried. In 2008, Fernandez spent time in a Texas jail for reckless use of a weapon. DCFS documents reviewed during the investigation found that Gabriel had a lacerated liver and a deviated septum, both injuries likely caused by Fernandez and Aguirre's abuse. In March of 2012, 14 months before Gabriel's death, Los Angeles DCFS hired Philip Browning to take charge of the department on an interim basis. Browning immediately began making changes, including increasing the amount of training time for social workers from eight weeks to one year. DCFS eventually asked Browning to stay on permanently. When asked about Gabriel's case, Browning said, this is something that should have never happened. It keeps me up at night. Browning also said about the case, quote, this is a situation where it would have been much better if this child would have been removed from the family and placed in a safe setting. Obviously, something wasn't done correctly. This was a tragic situation, and I think what we're trying to do is ensure that it never happens again. In June of 2013, in response to Gabriel's death, Los Angeles County supervisors voted to approve a new Blue Ribbon Commission, which would seek new methods to prevent the death of more children. DCFS in Los Angeles County had cases on approximately 30,000 children at any given time. The final vote was three to two in favor of the Blue Ribbon Commission. The Blue Ribbon Commission consisted of 10 members. First on the commission's agenda was to quote, 
review previously delayed or failed efforts to implement reforms and provide recommendations for a reasonable plan of action to expeditiously implement needed reforms. Another issue to be addressed came from complaints that DCFS's actions at times are made hastily and workers have moved children from homes when they could have benefited more from other services. In April of 2014, the Blue Ribbon Commission released a report described as, quote, scathing towards the actions of DCFS. The report recommended over 40 changes to the manner in which DCFS handles child abuse and neglect cases. In September of 2015, a new training center for LA County social workers was opened to help implement some of the recommended changes. A new agency, the Office of Child Protection, was created to help with other reforms. A quote, child welfare czar was also appointed to improve communication between agencies who investigate abuse and neglect allegations and work with children and families. Other improvements were instituted by DCFS after Gabriel's death. The department hired over 1,000 new caseworkers to ease the overwhelming caseloads of workers. Workers were issued smartphones, new training was instituted, and the standards for the Voluntary Family Maintenance Program, which Gabriel's family had been in, were re-evaluated. On April 4, 2016, arrest warrants were issued for investigators Stephanie Rodriguez and Patricia Clement, as well as Rodriguez's supervisor, Kevin Baum, and Clement's supervisor, Gregory Merritt. Rodriguez and Clement were accused of falsifying reports in Gabriel's case, which showed the escalation of abuse and neglect, leading to Gabriel's death. Baum and Merritt were accused of knowing, or not knowing when they should have known, that they approved investigators' reports, and that because of these falsified reports, Gabriel was left in the home where he eventually would be killed. On April 12th, the four social workers were officially charged with child abuse for falsifying reports and improper investigation. By this time, all four had been fired by DCFS. Clement had to file bankruptcy. Baum had taken a job working to evaluate custody in divorce cases, but was fired after he was charged in Gabriel's case. Merritt had not been able to find a steady job. He found part-time work stocking beer at the Antelope Valley Fairgrounds. Rodriguez had moved out of Palmdale. Attorneys for the defendants stated that their clients were being singled out for the failure of many other workers who were not being held accountable. They gave as an example that a caseworker and a therapist had been granted immunity for their involvement in exchange for testifying against their clients. One of Merritt's attorneys even pointed the finger at Gabriel's teacher, Jennifer Garcia, saying that she did not do enough to protect her student. His reasoning was that when Garcia felt there was enough to call in a complaint, she called Rodriguez directly, but all reports are supposed to be made directly to the hotline. Rodriguez instructed Garcia to call her directly, and the defense attorney's attempt to point blame at Garcia seemed unfounded. Judge Villar was having none of it. She told the attorneys that their client should have realized that Gabriel was being abused and should have filed a petition with the court to remove him. She said that no one ordered a medical exam for the boy and that they didn't even bother to review the family's case history in the computer system. They also did not document Gabriel's injuries as required. Assistant District Attorney Ana Maria Lopez said that the four defendants made, quote, a deliberate choice to circumvent the system. She said they disregarded proper handling of the case and falsified reports that would have otherwise documented the increasing violence of Aguirre and Fernandez against Gabriel. She said, quote, it was their responsibility to protect Gabriel, to remove this child and put him in a safe place. That's where they failed. On April 17th, all four defendants pleaded not guilty to one count of felony child abuse. Judge Lomelli, who said that Gabriel's death was foreseeable, said, quote, I have spent a lot of time, needless to say, on the case. This isn't something I did by the seat of my pants. Judge Lomelli told the attorneys that their clients failed to document the abuse inflicted upon Gabriel, as well as Fernandez's repeated failures to cooperate with the investigations. Judge Lomelli accused the defendants of showing, quote, an improper regard for human life 
and, quote, a lack of vigilance. After the trial, prosecutors said this was the first instance in Los Angeles County where charges were brought against social workers for failure to perform their duties. The four defendants are currently awaiting trial. LA County's DCFS director, Philip Browning, thought the field of child abuse prevention needed to be similar to that of law enforcement's handling of domestic violence cases. Mandatory arrest laws require police to arrest alleged perpetrators anytime there is probable cause, regardless of whether the victim wants to file charges. Prosecutors are also required to prosecute perpetrators for domestic violence, no matter what the victim's wishes are. In LA County, a report of domestic violence by a romantic partner requires a police report to be filed. But if the victim is a child, no report is required. The responding officer can simply make an entry in his or her log report. Police must also forward any allegations of domestic partner abuse to prosecutors. In the case of a child being the victim, police have no mandates. On Clement's last visit to the home on March 6th, Fernandez told her she no longer wanted services from the program. Clement wrote in her report, quote, it is this worker's assessment that mother is overwhelmed with her own emotional pain. She is unwilling to continue counseling at this time. There are no safety or risks to the children's welfare at this time. She also recommended closing the family's case. Although Merritt was required to read the family's entire file before closing it, apparently he was unable to do so at the time because of his overwhelming caseload. He said that he had to rely on Clement and approved closing the case on her recommendation. In November of 2017, the Lancaster City Council, which is a town about 10 miles from Palmdale, voted to have their city attorney draft an ordinance to improve documentation made by social workers. Angela Underwood, a councilwoman for the city of Lancaster, was credited with leading the attempt to help prevent another case like Gabriel's. The reforms would require social workers in LA County to digitally record all visits made to homes in Lancaster. Assemblyman Tom Lackey used the ordinance to craft a bill giving specific goals and requirements for social workers and law enforcement in California. The bill, called Gabriel's Law, was put forth as a bill in front of the California legislature. The bill was AB 1911. The requirements that Gabriel's law would mandate, among other things, better, more widespread and technologically advanced communication between numerous agencies. Gabriel's law would be mandated to the DCFS, public social services, and law enforcement personnel in the state of California. Despite best efforts, on April 26, 2018, the bill, better known as Gabriel's law, was rejected by a vote of five to two. Please do me a favor, Ishers. If you see something, say something, and do not stop saying something until action is taken to protect a child in need. There were numerous red flags and reports of child abuse in Gabriel's case. He could have been saved. A child's life is worth causing a ruckus if that's what it takes to make someone listen and take action. February happens to be Gabriel's birth month. Born on February 21st, 2005, Gabriel would be turning 14 years old this month. I know this was an especially difficult episode to get through. I appreciate you listening. If you'd like to discuss this case with me, head over to the Murderish Facebook discussion group. If you haven't joined the group yet, what are you waiting for? We talk tons of true crime in there, and we also tackle other important topics like the Real Housewives of New Jersey. I was so relieved to see that everyone came correct and said they were hashtag Team Marge. You can also chat with me on Twitter at MurderishPod and on Instagram at MurderishPodcast. If you like Murderish, do me the biggest favor and hit the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app and tell a friend about the show. I'd also love it if you left the show a positive rating and review in iTunes. You can also support Murderish by supporting sponsors. This episode was sponsored by Zola and EveryPlate. Check out episode show notes for links and promo codes for both. Also, stick around for another minute at the very end of this episode to hear a promo for a brand new podcast 
my friend Morph and his friends are launching. The podcast is called Three Men and a Mystery. Interested in extra murderish perks? Go to patreon.com slash murderish, where your monthly support could give you access to Patreon-exclusive bonus content, as well as other Patreon perks, including t-shirts, stickers, a shout out on the podcast, discount codes at the merch store, and other cool stuff. Want to show the world you're not a murderer, just murderish? Check out my online merch store at murderishpodcast.threadless.com. I have t-shirts, coffee mugs, and other stuff available. Email any comments or questions you have to murderishjamie at gmail.com. That's murderish, J-A-M-I, at gmail.com. Murderish is mixed and mastered by John Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music in this episode was composed by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by murderish researcher Steve Field. I hope to see some of you at the True Crime Podcast Festival in Chicago this summer. For more info, go to tcpf2019.com. That's tcpf2019.com. If you decide to buy a ticket, tell them Jamie from Murderish sent you. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this show doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. Murder-ish.